Good morning, church. Good to see everybody here this morning on this cold and rainy day after it was, what, 90 a couple days ago? <laughs> Gotta love Idaho. But we're just so glad to have you with us this morning. This morning we want to celebrate God's love that he has for us, his love that pursues us. And so I just really want to encourage you to join with us as we worship him. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are just so grateful, God, for who you are and all that you are. Lord, your word says that you inhabit the praises of your people, Lord Jesus. So, God, as we exalt your name this morning, as we come together as brothers and sisters, Lord, and exalt your name, I pray that your presence, your spirit, your love would fill this place, Lord God, in such a powerful, tangible, mighty way, Lord Jesus. We love you so much, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Single precious. Oh, single precious is a flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no, other thoughts I know. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. All souls atoned by the blood of the Lamb, I'm not a slave to what will tell me tent. How beautiful that cleansing blood. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. We're singing, oh, precious is a flow that makes me. White as snow, oh no, other fountains I know. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. Oh, 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 Shackle me, how infinite that grace divine. I am free, I am free, I am a child of God. We're singing, oh, precious is a flow that makes me white as snow. How precious there is power in the blood. Let's declare this morning, yeah. yeah. How priceless, how precious there is power in the blood of Jesus. How priceless, how precious there is power in the blood. There is power, power. Wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power. Wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power. Wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power. Wonder working power. I was buried deep with Christ my Lord. Now I'm raised to life forevermore. My name's been carved upon your heart. No, not death, no, not 
what hell could ever keep us apart? Oh, we're singing, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other bounds I know. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. Singing, oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other bounds I know. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. I am washed. Sing that all again. Singing, oh, precious is a flow that makes me white as snow. No other faults I know. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched. Now we are 
his love this morning. Great is your love, God. You surround us, Jesus. You surround us, God. Psalms 46 says that our God is an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth give way or the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar with foam and the mountains quake with its surging, be still and know that he is God. He will be exalted in the heavens and on the earth. All of our hope is in him. To say that all my hope is in you, Jesus. All our hope, God. It's all our hope, Jesus.
Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I will, you will never let me go. You've taken me from the miry clay. You set my feet upon the rock, and now I know. that the end here, Lord Jesus, is just the, just the beginning, God. It's just the prelude for what's to come, Lord Jesus. God, that we will spend an eternity worshiping you. Lord, even now, Lord, we join with the saints, with the angels, with the citizens of heaven, Lord Jesus, worshiping you, God, the, the almighty king, the lamb who was slain, the holy one, Lord Jesus the one whose love is enough, who pursues us to the ends of the earth, that no height, nor depth, nor principalities, things present, things to come, nothing can separate us from your love, Lord Jesus. You hold on to us, Lord Jesus. You surround us with your love. You wrap us, you drench us, you bathe us in your love, Lord Jesus. And that perfect love that casts out fear, Lord, and we love you, God. We love you, Jesus. Remind us to lean into you, to press into you, to abide in you, Lord Jesus. To not walk out this morning, God, having felt your love and not experience it again, Lord, because of our distractions, Lord. We cling to your love, Lord Jesus we know that you're holding on to us. And in the precious name of 
Jesus, his church said. Amen. Take a moment to respectfully and safely share his love with each other. We're so glad for each one of you that are here. Wow. Well, I think control has been lost. All right, we're going to ask you to take your seats and open your heart. We want to give a warm welcome to those of you that are in the building and as well as those who are joining us on, on City Hope Online Church. Today we mark, we've had several Sundays now that we've actually been able to come back and be in the building. And three months ago, City Hope, City Hope Online was birthed. And uh, I might just mention, those of you that are watching today, that uh, drop us a line. Let us know that you're, you're watching and, and listening. And, and um, if you've got some things you want us to pray about, please Get them, get them to us, and we will, we will respond. Um, I know that not all of you that are here today are familiar with a man by the name of Dave Reaver, but just to help me out, how many of you are? You're familiar with Dave Reaver? Okay. This goes back to he had a life-changing experience when he was over in Vietnam, and God has used him to touch so many people with his story. And I, I'm not going to tell you his story. I'm going to let him tell you. But this is a man who is doing so many things now and continuing to work with uh, veterans as they come back, some of them with scars like what, what he has. But I, I know, I know that you'll enjoy it. And if you're sitting next to somebody who raised their hand, you can just ask him. Did you really enjoy him before? And they'll tell you yes. So go ahead and do that. Did you Did you ask the person next to you? Have you heard him and was, yeah. It was definitely worth your time. We're just blessed to be able to have him here next week. So we'd like to have you come. Also, our, our summer adventure has started with our children and the activities they're going to be involved in. And we, we encourage you, if you know people who need that, we'd love to have a chance to work and to... to um, provide a wonderful time for, for their children. And it's there. We're here. You know, school got out uh, just a few days ago, but actually it got out about three weeks ago. I mean, three months ago. Strangest thing that happened. Uh, I've seen snow days before, but never have I seen about three months of, I guess you'll call it virus days. Uh, if we were to take a vote here, is there anybody that would vote along with me to no longer have to have three-month virus days. Anybody? Oh, that's so good. We've got, we got, I'm in the right group. I'm in the right, right group. Well, what's been, what's been happening in your life? See, this is, this is different. This whole um, COVID situation, this virus is, is enough by itself. But then you have, you have a man that is killed and where it appears that that it wouldn't it wouldn't have had to be that, and then riots, and then buildings burning, and then 
police being assaulted and killed. I, I, I find myself thinking the world right now, at least looking from the surface, looks like it's a mess. Do you agree with me or am I? Oh, good, because I wanted to make sure I was in the right place here. It's, it's just like it's a giant mess. What is a believer in Jesus Christ to do besides yell at the TV? What should our response be? Should we pull back and not make any waves? Do we bury our heads in the sand and try to hold on till Jesus comes? Some of you, if you know me very long, you've heard me mention there's a there's a hymn, and I like I like old old music, new music, in between music, but there is one song, one hymn that my dad passed this on to me because he didn't like it either, and it was actually in the hymn book, but the title of the, of the song was "Hold the Fort, for I am coming," and the song started off as "Hold the Fort, for I am coming," reinforcements still, wave the answer back to heaven. By God's grace, we will. And that song, that song is saying that we, we're, we're, we're going to hold on somehow. But when I read in the scriptures, what I see over and over and the things we sung about this morning is that we're not put in a position where we have to barely hang on by our fingernails. We are more than conquerors. At least that's, that's what my Bible says. We are conquerors. We are not people who are, are left lost with no idea of what to do. We're not a people who have to just, just hope with all hope, not in the real good hope way. Hope is supposed to be something that's final, but what, uh, what's become for some people is I hope so. Do we bury our heads in the sand? Do we try to hold on till Jesus comes? That's kind of what I want to talk about some today. You know, in the light of, of all of the incredible and, and frightening times, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to respond? Because God has given us a, our life pattern in his book we call His Word. With, with all this going through my mind, I received a document that had been put together called the Final Transition Team Report. And I, I guess it was, it was commissioned to to look and it was called a more equitable city for everyone. And this is new new leadership and I think in our city and there were a bunch of people that helped put this together. And somebody gave a, gave me a copy of it and I was reading it and apparently this team which put together the report is considering a new dream for Boise. And after reading the report I I started having some concerns about it. I had to file back through the dreams I have for Boise, and, and they didn't match up very well with, with these dreams. And um, after reading it, I just have to say I have concerns about it. I don't know people, the people on this team, and I don't know those, those leaders, but I know they start out talking by talking about new policies that will be coming, and... And I'm quoting this, the effect of said policy will impact communities subject to historic inequities. Now there's a verse in the scripture which says, be careful because with much talk there is sin. When a lot of big words are used, it makes me, it makes me look at them two or three times. But historic inequities... And I think what that means is they're saying that they're convinced that things are not fair as they are. I'm just trying to, I don't know any of these people. And then they talked about when it comes to justice, <coughs> that all processes which seek to model accountability include not only the determination of harm or wrongdoing, but reparative and sustainable redress while honoring the indigenous traditions from which these processes arise. Now I thought I'm going to read that and one or two people might understand what it's saying, but I bet you I lost a lot of you on, and I, I'm not, I'm not being critical of these people. I'm, I'm just saying that 
I, I was trying to get down to the basics of what what was happening here. Um, one of the things that they they see healthcare as being a basic right, and they said policy which directly addresses discrepancies associated with aspects of identity which should not determine these inequities. Somebody nudged the other person and said, "What's he saying?" And I'm not I'm not <clears throat> criticizing them. Those I, it's I, I know that it's been put together. And some things are hard to to. Um, finish but these core areas that, that they were talking about they guide the they want they want them to guide the policy practices and the procedures that will that will interrupt and and disproportionate the harmful impacts on the most vulnerable people who live and reside in Boise when I, I, I my my hat is off to anybody who wants to make this community a better place and my hat is off to people who want to do things to help people who are in trouble. And I just thank God so much for the pantry. Those of you that are involved with it, again, this, thousands of people each year are, are being helped there with food. But there were some other things that I, I looked at and I, I didn't know how that was going to work. Um, I think this is on the national scale too, but they put down to prohibit any evictions during the stay home order time period and prohibit utilities from being suspended and cancellation of rent and mortgages um, for all in Boise during the stay home order. And and I'm going, I'm seeing these things and one of the things that did happen and I I, I should mention to you if, if I haven't met you yet, if you're new here, I'm a little bit tight and some people would have reused both syllables, a tight wad. And so... I'm careful to, to see what comes in, and especially if I can feel a hand reaching for my wallet without permission. I'm looking here, and I see that um, if you have a, somebody who's a pretrial detainee and or a prisoner serving in j serving county jail sentences, that um, if it has to do anything with immigration, they're they're pretty much want to get you out of there. And cease arrests and bookings of people into the county jail, and to well, what did I see? One one of those places here. Well, the next just the next hundred days, um, designate a full time Boise City staff person to staff the City of Boise Human Rights Commission, and what they wanted to do was try to deal with any the effects of white white supremacy in in Boise. And um, and then also to end coordination and collaboration of localities. That's the police and the government with ICE. In other words, they the decision was made that that not to work with them and and kind of I guess it, it kind of becomes a sanctuary city and it has a nice sound to it and sanctuary people. But I just started thinking about that and. And I thought, all oh, this is going on in the place where I live, and I don't know everybody's motives or what they are, but I do know that they want they want things to be better, and I think that's something to be commended for. But I, I think that I I, I'm, I I looked at this and I thought, I need to I need to think and pray about this. Um, oh, they did say that he wanted to have less hours work week. Some people would like that. Um, uh, ongoing equity and inclusion efforts. Um, where were the couple of them there? Oh, launch a study and review of major city landmarks, streets and monuments and public spaces and historical sites across the city of Boise and provide recommendations for change. And I, I kind of wondered about that because I thought that's why you put them there so people will remember and and that was kind of a concern. And um, they said people are often intimidated by the notion and misconception that the American way is the only acceptable way. And, you know, call me call me stupid, but I kind of like the American way. I'm, I've been proud. But, but you have to understand, I've lived in America all my life. There were some other things here that, oh, um, I, well, I don't want to waste your time. There, 
Well, this, this then this is the part that got down, and this is the part that made me realize that I was going to be standing up in front of you today talking about something that I don't usually talk about. Um, they... Free contraception as defined by the CDC, abortion and reproductive health care. And secondly, collaborate with the Boise School District to establish sex education at pre-K level through 12th. And then lastly, create citywide school curriculum teaching the history of indigenous persons, colonization and slavery in this region. Well, they really got they really got my attention when it said free contraception and abortion and reproductive health care. Because what they what's happened here is that has stepped into the arena of this book. Amen. And it's it's amazing that it used to be that people who would talk about about pro-life or against or their pro-abortion, whatever, whatever those two, um, they some one one of the sites talked about it as being basically a tissue mass, and it's gotten now to where no matter whether you're pro-life or not pro-life, people are regarding that tissue mass as being a person. It's interesting that health and welfare. There was something they came up with as they were figuring out ratios for homes. And they actually said that if a woman is pregnant, that they count that as two people in the home. Now that's, I think that's progress because I do believe it's a people. And um, then there was that collaborate with the Boise School District to establish sex education at pre-K level through 12th. It, it seems that people of influence in our community are considering and seem to be determined to do a lot of things that possibly are questionable in our home city. And some of those things could do major shaping of our children and grandchildren. And I... I I need to expose a, a bias that I had. You said you wanted to get close to my children and my grandchildren. <laughs> um, I'm kind of I, I, I'm kind of taken by them, and I've I've kind of been real proud and biased of them, and I've been protective of them, and and if I see something that might have the the potential to affect them in a in a negative way then I have to ask and say, God, what, what, what's happening here? What are we going to do here? Um, I guess I could put it this way. What, what they and others want as well to do in the city of Boise is against some of the strongest mandates that God gives us in his word. He does say, thou shalt not kill, doesn't he? And... I can tell you without any hesitation that God is pro-life. I know some of you might be relieved. <laughs> and we as, we as a church, we, none of us here are good enough to where we can judge anybody for what they have done or haven't done. So when people can come in here, it's a place of hope. It's a place for people who've done a lot of things right and it's a place for a lot of people for, for a lot of people who've done things wrong. But we don't make the judgment as to what they've done is right or wrong. But we do try to bring wisdom alongside so that we can live by God in a way that that honors his word because it works. We had a service, a memorial service, celebration service for Lucille yesterday. Lucille for a while. And just as people talked about her life, all the things that she did, all the giving things that she did, she just lived in a way that she wanted to honor God. And it's, it's so neat to hear people at the end of their lives that have, have dedicated themselves to God, 
their lives are so much different than, than others who have maybe been more occupied um, just, you know, on their own selves. God is so filled with love for his creation that even those who at the point in their lives took the life of a little unborn one through abortion, God freely and instantly offers complete forgiveness and he comes into their lives and claims them as his very own children. Now sometimes we, if we have in disciplined our children or, or if somebody does something wrong to us, we might say, that will forgive you, but I'm not ready to forgive you yet. That's where we differ from God quite a bit because God forgives. God forgives. If you breathe, you breathe your request to God that he forgive you for something that you really feel that you stepped off of it. It's instant. It's quicker than instant. You are forgiven. It's gone. It's, it's, as we read in the Bible, buried in the deepest sea, never to be remembered again. So in this room right here, we look at a lot of people that aren't people that are perfect. They're, we're all pretty imperfect. But we've found the grace in God's perfection as we have, have asked him to please forgive us. And he's washed away those things that were keeping us away from him. And that's available to anybody who's listening this morning. He freely offers complete forgiveness and comes into their lives and claims them as his own very, his very own children. The only reason that abortion is still around is because God gave men and women and boys and girls a free will. It's a very powerful thing, free will. To anyone hearing my voice, either in this building or online, the Bible says that all, all, that's every one of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us have in some ways gone against God's plans and purposes. But God's word also says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, please listen to me for these next few moments. There are agendas in our country that are being advanced by people who are not interested in what God is saying. It would not be untrue to say that some of these people are at a point in their lives that they would make a mockery of God's word. God still reaches out to them and extends his love to them, but many are still determined to go in the wrong direction. In the meantime, what do we do? Do we simply let people with ungodly principles that will destroy our country go off unchecked? I've quoted this before, uh, actually even from the pulpit here, but it made such an impact on me many years ago. There's a man by the name of Josh McDowell who is a Christian apologist. And if he, one of the little kids is saying, Mommy, is that somebody that apologizes for God? <laughs> no, not actually, but a Christian apologist. And he made a statement that to this day and has over these past years haunted me. Josh McDowell said, we are only one generation away from a nation of apostasy. And what that means is, we are only one generation away from being a country that no longer follows God. Some people say, how could that ever happen? I'll tell you, I've been surprised by how, how quickly different groups have gotten the attention of, of our whole country. I mean, I mean, there are people just tearing their hair wondering what, what they're going to do next. Uh, I mean, it's incredible. But his statement there, we're one generation away from apostasy. And what that's saying is the kids right now, the, the people that are kids that are coming up, the direction that they take is the direction that our country is going to take. We have to make a decision where that should be and to help influence it and not leave it 
to people who have maybe an extremely different idea. And one of the things to help with this, whether you're a grandparent or parents or if you never had children or if you, whatever point in life that you're on, I've ordered a booklet and I was just sick because it's brand new and it's just coming off the press and it won't be here for another week or so. And I have it and we will have it and I'm going to give it to you if you will take it. It's, it's a booklet for everyone here and also those online, if you request it, we will have those. It's coming in the next two weeks. I read this book and I was appalled by what I read. In fact, it kind of lit a fire under me. First of all, this book is being published by the Family Research Center in Washington, D.C. This is a group that is um, people of faith that, that have, have put this together. Um, we want to give those to you at no charge. But with well over 87% of school children in America in attendance at public schools, you're going to find it shocking what is becoming standard in them. Playing games at extremely young ages where they deal with, I should be a boy or a girl. Then there were kids learned from, there was, there was kids that learned from presumably their teachers where to go get the contraceptives or helping them be able to find, go to a place called Planned Parenthood who would be happy to help them. How to take care of a, a getting an abortion without the parents knowing about it. I didn't like that one. Some groups would seek to not have opt-out from the sex education classes, even when their morals are completely opposite to ours. Yes, that would, that would, that would be going against the sanctity of life and some of these things. I actually, I had a kind of a, what do you call it, a press run of this that isn't all fancy and everything else, but it had a few excerpts that I want to read to you. It says here, what was once simply imparting science-based information and skills to save sex until marriage has now become creating young radical sexual ideologues with a desire to exercise their sexual rights. Preparing children to have sex with multiple partners over the course of a lifetime seems to be a basic assumption underlying much of sexual education content. Needless to say, this is not in line with Christian and other faith views on sexuality and marriage. Can you say amen to that? In, in Fairfax County, Virginia, Parents naturally assume their eighth graders' abstinence lesson encouraged kids to remain abstinent until marriage. But curriculum drafters had another kind of abstinence in mind. Abstinence until your next steady boyfriend or girlfriend. The lesson plan includes a decision-making exercise that guides them to be sexually abstinent until they're in a faithful monogamous relationship. Officials in California are insisting that sex ed lessons be inclusive of sexual relationships with multiple partners. The California State Health Department instructs teachers to talk to children as young as 12 about their sex partners and to avoid terms like boyfriend and girlfriend because some students may be non-monogamous. This is, this is what some of what I want you to have that will get your heart stirred up. Meanwhile, public schools are opening girls' bathrooms to biological male students who identify as girls. Can't they just use the teacher's bathroom? People say no, nope, because transgender activists say that that would be being bullies. Hmm. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna just you, just, you need to get some of this because it needs to drive us to our knees. Who would suspect that in an assembly on suicide would be used to promote the LGBTQ agenda. In West Virginia, students were shown a popular anti-suicide video set to music by rap artist Logic. The video with high production values and award-winning recognizable actors features a teen boy exploring a new same-sex relationship. One day his father comes home to discover his son in bed with another boy. The video shows scenes of the son being bullied at school 
in anguish, contemplating suicide. Eventually, the son wins over his father, and the video ends with gauzy footage of the son's gay wedding and the father's embrace of the couple's adopted baby. Don't ask me where you can go see that movie. Um, after one such screening, a teacher told students not to tell parents about it. Wouldn't a true anti-suicide message encourage students to talk with their parents? All public schools in California, New Jersey, and Illinois are now required to teach children LGBTQ history. In Illinois, schools are not even allowed to purchase history textbooks that fail to include an LGBTQ angle. School districts are considering denying the right of parents to opt their children out of these sexuality-based lessons. And this is one I think more people heard about. With cameras flashing, kindergarten children sat on the library floor listening to HRC spokesman Sarah McBride, a man who identifies as a woman, read transgender theme books and tell them he's really a woman. Parents in this Arlington, Virginia public school learned the details after the fact, but the school made no apologies. You know, some of you, a lot of you have your kids already grown, but for parents, do we even know what's in our school's library? With all that's going on in our country, the last thing for us to do is bury our heads in the sand. I could come and be in a worship service like what, what was happening earlier and just feel so blessed and say, oh, that's, that's going to take me for another week. But the last thing we can do with all the things that are going on is bury our heads in the sand. Wishing things weren't like they were is not God's answer. Can you think of any time in God's word when there was a situation that needed change where God says, go out and wish really hard and click your heels together? Somebody said, yeah, what, what chapter is that? <laughs> That's the Wizard of Oz chapter. That's not... Wishing things weren't like they were is not God's answer to problems. God's answer is in Second Chronicles... You've heard it so many times. You can quote it, 714. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We need to pray. And we need to pray some more. For Christians who are seeking to apply biblical principles to the to their to their life to these issues to discernment to to wisdom it's it's needed according to paul we if you if you read romans 13 i'm not going to take the time this morning but government is ordained by god to promote good and restrain evil did you get that god's plan for government is to promote good and to restrain evil and God authorizes the government to wield the sword for the administration of justice. Voting is an exercise in delegating God-ordained authority because power resides with the people in our republic. Power resides with us when we vote because then we're delegating the ruling authority to others. As, you know, as Christians... We need to follow our convictions to their logical ends by voting for candidates and parties that support clear biblical values. The Bible is loaded with God's people who were forced to take a stand. Some of them paid a great price. We can go back and start toward the front of the Bible and see Joseph and what he went through and the miracles God did for him. And then there was Moses, an unlikely leader, a fellow who was not really interested in the job. And then came Joshua, the faithful sidekick who became leader. And, of course, David, the youngest of the brothers, the one that his father didn't even bother 
to call him into the, the compound of their, of their <clears throat> land when Samuel was looking for people to maybe be potential kings. No, his dad thought, no, not David. It wouldn't work, but he got in there, and that's when Samuel went over and poured oil over his head and said, you're the guy. Esther. I've always loved that story. Esther's uncle looked at her as they were facing annihilation. That's pretty serious. Would, would you agree? Tell the person next to you, that's really serious. Annihilation. They want to kill all of the people that are like you. Her uncle looked her in the eye and he said, you, Esther, have come to royal position for such a time as this. Ruth, oh, Ruth's another one. And Daniel, we just go on and on. Daniel, I loved him. I just, I just, these guys, it's like they're fearless. Daniel, Daniel had the opportunity to be pretty quiet about how he felt. And when they told him that people were told not to pray to anyone other than the king, he went to his house and, I mean, Let's just say he was pushing it a little bit. He goes out in the window, you know, pulls the drapes. If it were now, he could go ahead and have a, a sound system like this so the whole block could hear. And he goes there and he's calling on his God. Yeah, he could get in trouble. Yes, he did. He got in trouble. What'd they do? They threw him into a den of lions whose master was the Lord on high. God created those lions. I can just picture, you know, when you're a little kid, you have all these things, the ways you, you set up these pictures of the Bible stories. I could just picture when, when Daniel got thrown into the lion's den, and I could just picture God up in heaven looking down and saying, ah, sit. But we're hungry. No eat. I mean, we didn't see what was going on in the background. He didn't come out with a scratch. Think about that. Isn't that amazing? Hungry lions, they could have torn him to shreds. And the thing that's neat about it, it I don't see anywhere here where, where Daniel is kind of whistling, oh, poor me, or why did I do that? Or He stood up. He was God's man. Got thrown in there. He went. I'm just, in my mind, I can picture him laying with his head on the side of the lion because it would be nice and soft and furry and in the morning the king came out scared to death and Daniel's down there saying yeah I had a good sleep and the reason we know that these lions were hungry because when they took David out of the lion's den he went and got these men who were his advisors who were not giving good advice and I guess it's different than how you fire somebody now um they lioned them. Is that the term? They lioned them. They threw those guys into the, into the pit. And the lions, I can just picture them looking over their shoulder. Now God? And God said, okay, go ahead. And they said, oh, yummy. And those lions, those lions were so thankful. You know, every part of God's creation does what God tells it to do except people. Isn't that true? Every bit of God's, God's creation. It's time for God's people to not shrink back in fear of being criticized. It's time to take a stand and to stand up for our values. I'm not going to ask you for an answer and I'm not going to ask you to vote and I'm not going to ask you for point to point to somebody else. But are you afraid, are we afraid of being criticized? for our godly views. Are we refused to say that, that when you take a baby out of the womb, that you're killing, a, you're killing a person? Are we afraid to say that? Now, I'm not talking about going and, and just harassing people who've made a mistake, but I'm saying, are we, are we willing to be criticized? What about, what about 
that somebody said, because this part about, about sex education from kindergarten through high school is something that this group of people want to bring to Boise. Are you afraid that if you were to go to a meeting then you got up and said something that people might laugh at you? Or might people, some people might want to say, come on, get out of the dark ages. I don't want to be afraid. If God opens the door for me to do it, I want to be willing to do it. I'm not going to go and jump all over somebody's case, but I could stand there and say, I believe that that baby is, is a human being and should be given the opportunity to live. And I believe that for my family. That's what we taught our family. That's what our family now is teaching their family. And rather than, and, and just, you know, speak it, like, speak it like it is. Are we willing to do that? It's easy for the church to like to get blessed. It's like, I, okay, this worship this morning, it was wonderful. But what happens when we go out and we need to stand up? I've, I've always liked this verse in 2 Timothy because Timothy was, was mentored by, by Paul. And he writes in 2 Timothy 1, verse 6, I'm writing to encourage you, he's talking to Timothy, to fan into a flame and rekindle the fire of the spiritual gift God imparted to you when I laid my hands upon you. For God will never give you the spirit of fear. But you need to, if you don't have it, when you get home, write that somewhere. Put it where you can see it. God will never give you the spirit of fear. Well, then where does the spirit of fear come from? It must come from the enemy. Tell the person next to you, God will never give you the spirit of fear. Tell them. Now, in case you forget that, let me tell you again, God will never give you the spirit of fear. And that verse finishes out, but the Holy Spirit who gives you mighty power. Oh, isn't that great? He gives you mighty power and love and self-control. So we've got the power and then God gives us the love for these people and then he gives us self-control so that we don't push them away from God. We invite them to God. I read something recently from one of the organizations, Christian organizations that's on the hill in D.C. And this little sentence said, pastors should help educate and equip their members to think biblically about political issues, candidates, and party platforms. When a, when a political party puts together their platform, I want to know what it says. And if it says things that are anti-Bible, then you'll see me with the other party. Now, I would never, we've never told people how they should vote. We've never tried to, tried to somehow impose that. But what I want to encourage you to do, I want to encourage you to be sure that you vote. Be sure that you vote. And when you vote, vote as a believer would vote, knowing that you're, you're going to uphold God's will. It's easier just to sit back and not say a word and just say, well, let's let it go. And you know, for, for Linda and I, we've, our kids, our kids are grown, but our grandkids aren't. And the thought of surrendering them to any kind of a machine that is going to teach them everything opposite to what we know this book says is true, I can't stand and just watch it happen. So, not with sh screaming, sh shrill screaming voices, not with signs and you're hitting people over the head with them, not with people coming out and telling people that they're so wrong or they're murderers or they're this or they're that. If we see something that's not consistent with what God is asking of his people, you have the right to stand up and say, you know, I just can't vote for that because, you know, I live my life by God's word, by the Bible. And in his word, that's a life. 
That is a real life. And it's the same way when it comes to teaching these kids. You know, God, God said, uh, you know, he created a man and he created a woman. And he's the one that put them together. And nowhere, nowhere did, nowhere did, did he say that you could choose a different, a different sex if you didn't like the one you had. Somebody was talking here as, as about this. This isn't from the one of the books that we're going to have here that I want to give to you. And this kid, when he was really young, he was just a, a elementary age kid, and he started identifying as as a girl. And he was a boy, and and he he began going through different things and started to begin taking all kinds of uh, hormones. And then finally, at the age of 12, he had, um, they basically removed any genitalia that he had, and he went on. This was a decision that he made as a little kid. And, and, and the, the, the one person talking about that said, and now, for the rest of his life, he's going to be a woman. Somebody else said, well, not exactly. Because every chromosome in that little young man's life says he's male. Now, there's a reason why we have a school and a preschool. When a fellow by the name of Lauren Cunningham came to our church, he's the one who, who started Youth with a Mission. And he, he had a dream one night and where he saw waves coming on from like the ocean onto the shore. And as he looked closer, he saw that it wasn't water, but they were, they were people, young people. They were coming onto the shore. And those were people that God wanted to use to take the good news of the gospel all around the world. He was reading from Proverbs and he says, in Proverbs it says, the fear of God is the beginning of all knowledge. And when I heard that, I thought, he's right. Apart from this book, the rest of the knowledge isn't very useful. That's why in our school, this is on the curriculum. It's there. And it's why that you and I can stand up and say, if you're not going to change the curriculum, then we want vouchers because we want to choose to go to a place that teaches what our morals are not what somebody else's are. I've gone longer than I wanted to. But it's easy for just to forget, especially if, if it's not a key issue right now in our lives like it is in the people that we have here that have children. But I think the children are worth praying for. I feel the children of this community are worth praying for. And I, I want you... I want you right now to join with me. And if there are one or two of you who want to come up here, three, four, I'll hand you, hand you the mic and you can lead out in prayer. But I want everybody that's in this building right now as we close out to close out as we take as we take this situation to God. God is so good. He's given us God has given us so many chances. God has done so much for us. When God, I, I can say he in some ways he kind of woke me up because I've just kind of let those things go. All these things that were different. But it's time now. It's time now to do something. So, if you want to bow your heads, if you want to come up, just take a moment and pray. And then I'll have someone else, might, when I'll give the mic to you, you can pray. But when we leave this place, would you go, would you go with, with a commitment in your heart that you're going to be lifting up these generations that are coming? The next generation could cause us to be in a, in a, in a nation of apostasy. We don't need to have that. So I encourage you to bow your heads. And if you, you would like to to pray and then I'll close it up and we'll go but I'd like us to just put our hearts together in prayer and two or three of you can come up and 
get the mic and pray. So let's bow our heads together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. God, protect our children. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, hear us when we pray. Thank you for a pastor who is willing to speak from his heart the things that were ingrained in him from childhood. Not a childhood bereft of the word of God, but washed over and over throughout his life, the words of life. May he gather here today, born of that same spirit, not weak, not quiet, not abused, but Lord, empowered, empowered, empowered by your word, Father, that we may pray for ourselves, O oh God, that what was weak and what was ineffective, O oh God, might, for the sake of our children, for the sake of this nation, we might become effective for their sakes. Lord, for your sake, you have led us in a path of righteousness that we can determine within our hearts and in the hearts of those in our families, oh God, that we shall dwell, dwell, dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What is that house? That is the house where God dwells. Lord, that house Our hearts, our bodies, our thoughts, our desires are a prepared habitation for the Lord. Lord Jesus, hear our prayer today that we might lift up voices in praise and thanksgiving this day and every day because you are almighty. You are the God above every God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Pastor Ted. I just thank you for this message today. And it's a strong message. It, it, it tells us again about the ancient boundaries. And I just want to 
say that please meditate on that, what that really means. And we, today in worship, we worshiped over the blood of Jesus being shared for us. And I just see us all receiving that blood of Jesus. Well, what does that mean? That's more precious than gold, more precious than anything we can ever have. And it's the most precious message we could give anybody. The blood of Jesus for any problem there is, even an identity crisis a person may be having. I just ask God right now to touch us all, to help us accept the position, the station in our life, who we are. Whatever it is in your life, if you've ever struggled with something about yourself, right now accept your position, your station, man or woman, whatever you look like, accept it because God gave it to you for here. Accept it. In heaven, there's neither male nor female. All this is about God making you who you are and going out and just being able to take the blood to that person so they can accept their station because the power is in the blood. The power to be who we are is in the blood. I thank the Lord right now. I just thank him for that. And I thank this place of worship and help us to come together often to pray to pray for this country, to pray for this state, to pray for this city, and help us to be brave and strong in the places when we're out in public, to not be ashamed, not be ashamed to just say, thank you, Jesus, for this food, or even to bless it before you eat it, however it is, not to be ashamed to be able to say to someone, I can pray for you. Believe me, just, just saying that really opens the door. I just thank you, Lord. Give us courage. Give us the insight and in how you want to use us every day. I just thank you. Amen. Father, I just want to thank you for being raised in a home where you were, you were first... Thank you for being raised in a home where the Bible was, was the ultimate, ultimate book. Father, I thank you that my wife was raised the same way. And I just pray that even as we have raised our children, that we will see them. We want to see them be, follow you and their children. And God, we pray for generation after generation. I just ask you to light a fire under us, not a fire of aggression, not a fire of fighting, but that we will step out and say this is what we believe. And what we believe is valuable as well. And so if you show us an alternative and we'll work with that. God, help us to be able to respond in ways that even as your, as your uh, children did in the early church, when you said, I'll give you words to say, God, help us. Help us not to just say, I've got too many other things. It doesn't matter. Lord, the next generation does matter and the next generation after that. It won't happen by itself. We're here for that reason, that we can pass that generation, pass that word of God on. Thank you for each one that's here today. Thank you for your goodness that you've bestowed on us. Thank you for people today that you've lifted by your power. And God, as we go into the community, and the people that are in their homes right now online, God, as we prepare for this new week, may we be full of your love and your goodness. May we have the power of your Holy Spirit working in us. And may we be used of you, Lord, throughout the week to bring people closer to you. Thank you, Lord. We pray for our city, for our, for our state, for our, 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 our nation, Lord. And we just ask you to help us. Help us to be your, your people who are lifting up this country. We go now in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week. <laughs>